Subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a student and an advisor talking about facilities at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, I wonder if you could help me. I'm starting a course at Glenfield in a few weeks. I was just a bit worried about what facilities there will be and what I'll have to do. I'm especially interested in health and welfare stuff. Certainly. We normally send out a copy of our leaflet, Staying Healthy at Glenfield. I'm not sure why you haven't had it. Well, could you answer a few questions for me? Firstly, I'm wondering about how I get a doctor when I arrive. Well, you can register with the University Health Centre on North Campus. And do I have to pay for that? Not to register, but if you have to get medicines, there's a prescription charge of £6.50. OK. Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So, should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory, and if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't in fact register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street, but I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the North Campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever, really. They can even arrange financial help. Mm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the Nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is 0900 762 5913. I'll say it again. 0900 762 5913. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the South Campus in the Sports Centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of £22 to get a pass. But that will last you for the whole year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Is this information on the website? 
I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S O N Y. Uh, no, I'll spell it. S O N I A. Then Orr is O R R. Orr. Okay. And you said you were on Hills Road? Yes. But don't send it there, as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's GF 23 9BQ. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post, and you should get it soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You hear a club leader giving information to a group of young people who are planning to do a two-week holiday course at the Tamerton Centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, everyone. I've been asked to talk to you this afternoon about next month's trip to Tamerton Study Center for the two-week course. Now, some of the things I'm going to say you may have already heard or read about, but I think it's important to emphasize a few key points. First of all, it's worth reminding you why Tamerton was set up in the first place, in the late 1960s. That was really before all the concern with preserving the environment, which everyone talks about these days. The idea was simply to get people out of the cities and into the country, and to find out that just being outdoors can be very rewarding. This is not going to be a holiday in the usual sense. It's called an adventure course because you'll really be stretched to your limits, but that in itself can be a positive thing. The group I took last year, for example, said that although they actually felt pretty weak and exhausted all the time, <laughs> it really made them learn a lot about themselves and increased their confidence. And in the end, that's the most important thing. Now, all of you knew about policies at Tamerton before you signed up for it, so you know that in many ways it's quite old-fashioned. You don't have a lot of choice in what you do. But something which I think makes the place so special is that you get to try so many different things every day. For instance, one day you'll do climbing, and the next you'll be surveying rock pools. 
It's not intended that you become an expert in any of them. It's more like a taster, which you can follow up if you want. And there isn't a lot of free time. Organized activities and talks, etc., go on until 9 p.m., and lights go out at 11 p.m. There are table tennis tables with all the equipment and board games, though I have to say the pieces often go missing, so it's a good idea to take your own. There's a DVD player with a good selection of films suitable for this age group, so don't take yours. Bedtime at 11 p.m. is strictly enforced, and there's a good reason for this. You're all under 18, and we organizers need to know that all group members are accounted for in the house as we close for the night. And of course, you'll be so exhausted anyway that you'll be too sleepy to want to cause any trouble. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, what should you pack? The information sheet tells you a lot about what clothing to bring. But what about other things? Well, Tamerton House has its own small shop. But anything there is several miles away, so you won't have many opportunities for buying supplies. So in this last part of my talk, I'm going to explain what objects you should take with you to the center, what you can take if you want, and also, very importantly, what you cannot take. Several of you came up to me before this talk and asked whether you can take things like kettles or hair dryers. The answer is, there are plenty of these electrical appliances available in the center and they are of the proper voltage and are checked regularly. Yours may not be, so the rules at Tamerton say you can't bring them into the center because it's considered a fire risk. Remember, it's a very old house. Now another question was about cell phones. Although you definitely can't have them on during inside talks, you equally definitely need them when you're out on exercises. So they're a must, I'm afraid. Anybody who wishes to talk to me about borrowing a phone for the fortnight, please see me after this talk. Now, the weather's heating up at the moment, and you'll be outdoors a great deal. If you wear proper clothing, especially a hat, sun cream is optional. Also, they sell high-factor cream in the shop, so you don't have to take any of your own, unless there's a special kind you use. Now, there's a special note about things like deodorants, which come in aerosol cans. I need to tell you that these are banned in the center, because apparently they have the habit of setting off the fire alarms. If you want to take an aerosol can, you'll actually be at risk of being told to leave. And finally, people have been asking about whether they need to take towels. Well, the center does provide one towel per guest, which you're required to wash yourself. If you're happy with that, then don't bring another. If not, take one of your own. Just remember how much outdoor exercise you'll be doing and how dirty and wet you'll be getting. You might that is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two short talks about animals. 
Mark is going to talk about the koala. As you listen, complete the notes with the information you need. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon. Today we'll have two students, Mark and Philip, to talk about animals. Mark will be the first. Mark, please get straight down to business. Right. As you know, Australia has many unique species of animals due to its long geographical isolation, such as kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, wombats, dingoes, possums, platypuses, spiny antetras, and so on. Today, I'm going to talk about koalas. The koala is a sluggish, tailless, furry, arboreal marisipal. Koalas are different from state to state in colour and build, probably because of differences in climate and diet. In Queensland, for example, koalas typically have a red dish or tawny colour. In New South Wales, koalas are greyish, with ash-like flecking. In Victoria, they tend to be heavily built, with a shaggy coat of a brownish colour. Koalas tend to be solitary creatures. They come together to mate in spring and early summer. At mating time, the males are noisy and quarrelsome. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Baby koalas are born approximately 35 days after conception. Although furless and weighing only half of a gram, the baby koala climbs into the mother's pouch unaided. Six months later, it leaves the pouch. By now, the baby koala is fully furred and the mother carries it on her back or cuddles it to her chest for another six months. Normally, koalas have single babies and twins are rare. Koalas become mature completely after four years, although the female is sexually mature at about two years. Koalas only eat gum leaves and drink no water. The Aboriginal word koala means no water. But of the 500 eucalyptus species, Koalas eat only about 13. The koala's digestive system enables it to survive on a diet of gum leaves which consists largely of fibre which have a very low protein content. An adult koala eats around one kilo of leaves a day. In the wild, it is thought that the koala lives for about 10 years, although koalas in zoos may live for 20 years. The fully grown female koala measures about 60 centimetres. Males are bigger, measuring about 80 centimetres and weighing 13 and a half kilograms. The koala has two thumbs on each forepaw, opposed to three fingers. In climbing, it grips mainly with these and uses its rear paws for a toehold in a swift jumping action. It seems that koala may not always have looked as they do today. A recent discovered fossil jawbone indicates an animal almost twice the size of today's typical koala. Also, it may have kept to the ground and even knocked over small trees. Thank you, Mark. It's an interesting talk. Koala is my favourite animal. It's lovely and cute. 
Philip, now it's your turn. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a short news item. Fill in the gaps in the summary below with the correct word or phrase according to what you hear. Habits. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now, listen to the news item and answer the questions. The police are continuing their investigations and, based on new leads, expect to make an early arrest. The drought in northern THR continues to worsen, with tens of thousands of hectares of one slush pastoral land having now been without a single drop of rain for over 11 months. Farmers from the stricken region are beginning to despair, with meteorologists predicting that the drought is unlikely to break before Christmas. Many farmers have begun shooting their worst affected cattle and in some cases, entire flocks of sheep have been destroyed. These measures, tough and cruel though they may seem, are essential to prevent a possible outbreak of widespread disease. It is not only farm animals that are in trouble. Environmentalists are also concerned that the lack of water in rivers, lakes and streams will mean more native animals in the bush will die, unless rain comes soon. They believe the drought could have a lasting effect on the populations of such native animals as kangaroos, wallabies and koalas. Our reporter Colin Harrison is in Vance, talking with long-range weather forecaster Joseph Singer. Over to you, Colin. Joseph, can you give any indication as to when we might receive some rain in the affected regions of THR? Well, it's hard to say, of course, but I'm confident that the drought will break within approximately two months. If you look back at the data kept of previous periods of drought over the last hundred years or so, you see a cyclic pattern of severity developing, and we're now at the short end of the last cycle. I'm fairly certain that we'll see some rain either just before or just after Christmas. Let's hope so. Thank you, Joseph. Colin Harrison from the very hot and dry town of Vance in northern THR. Meanwhile, at the CSIRO laboratories in Ottawa, Encouraging developments have recently been made in the process of cloud seeding, a process by which clouds can be forced to make rain, and research scientists are to begin conducting trials of a new technique involving lasers later this month. If successful, the state government will be asked to contribute up to $5 million to establish permanent cloud seeding stations in areas most likely to be affected by drought in the future. For many farmers, though, any breakthrough will have come too late. Every week, more farming families are being forced to sell their homes, unable to survive financially, with little or no income to support them. A special assistance fund has been set up to help drought-stricken families. If you would like to send some money, 
You can do so by calling this number now. 001-43-8172 I'll repeat that number. 001-43-8172 That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.